So um, the three um, co-directors of the Purdue MRI facility are, will be here today to present and give an overview of the capabilities that we have for imaging in vivo, uh, for in vivo imaging at the uh, Purdue MRI facility. And um, we titled it from neurotransmitters to cartilage because we do a whole lot of different types of imaging. And so we hope to give you a nice overview of the capabilities and please feel free to put any questions into the chat at any time. We have um, three scanners, three MRI scanners in our um, combined facility. One is the small animal MRI facility that hosts a 70 Brooker um, MRI. And Dr. Diva Chen will talk about that uh, a little later in this talk. Then we have the life science MRI facility, which houses a Siemens Magnetum Prisma 3T human um, scanner, as well as the engineering MRI facility, which has a GE Discovery MR750 3 Tesla MRI scanner. And those two are housed together in the same building, uh, actually next to each other. So we have even had some studies that were using them simultaneously. Um, in research, all is possible. And if um, I'm posting here the website for our facility where you can actually go to all of these scanners and, and look up anything in detail more. We are a dedicated research facility. That means that all three scanners are available for research 24 hours, seven days a week. Um, there is no clinical, there are no clinical patients scheduled at any time that might bump you out from your research slot. Um, we do have state-of-the-art sequences and hardware in all the scanners. You will um, get an overview of more detailed um, technical details as well as what type of studies and sequences we do offer on each scanner. We have staff and support available to set up and run scans if you're not the MRI experts but you want to use them. That's the purpose of these scanners is um, to get users that um, are interested in, in making use of these and we will help you set up, we will help you um, advise you what kind of sequences are available, where, how to test them out and help you get started with any kind of research. Um, the whole facility is a CTSI and the university core facility. So there are, some, there are possibilities to get a CTSI core funds as well as some other funds for also getting started. And I'm mentioning the, the costs right here for the two human scanners, the costs are $500 per hour and for the animal scanner, it is $100 per hour at this moment. Um, but for help with setting up and testing whether or not you can even do your research, we usually allow you to use some development hours. Um, just talking about the two human scanners, as I mentioned before, and I'm going now to switch on the laser pointer again. They are housed side by side. This is a floor plan. They're really kind of next to each other, just with a storage room in between. Um, with the two control rooms here. And this facility, this whole um, building has been built specifically for this MRI. That means we do have also a wet preparation, wet lab preparation room, also for larger animals like dogs and, and pigs and so on. We have assessment rooms for psychological um, testing or for blood drawing or for any kind of other exams that you might want to do with your subjects uh, outside of the MRI scanner. Um, we, we have a nice little meeting room for meeting with your collaborators or for the students to work. Um, so th this whole facility is, is just a, its own little um, building with a parking space right in front of it for your subjects to come in. Um, we also, I think that's, I, I mentioned this here because this is quite different from many other uh, places, especially the clinical, more clinical oriented um, scanner types. We welcome graduate students and we train graduate students to, um, to learn how to run the MRI scanners and to, to run the MRI research. Um, we do have, a, we offer a whole lot of MRI courses on campus. I've made a list here, but actually you can find this list of, of courses on our web page as well. So if you have a graduate student in your group that is interested in learning these, um, how to run the MRI part of your project, um, we very much welcome that and they're allowed to learn it and become primary operators. We have a very um, structured way of becoming a primary, first a secondary, and then a primary operator with all the safety features included. 
um, but graduate students are welcome to learn it. And with that, I'm going to jump into um, presenting the Life Science MRI scanner, which is the Siemens scanner. And um, later on, Dr. Rispoli and Dr. Chen will take over and present the other two scanners. So for the Life Science MRI facility, that scanner is supported, mo mostly financially supported by the College of Health and Human Sciences at Purdue. We currently have about 19 different user groups. That means PIs with their groups um, that come in and have uh, projects running. And we also um, have additional pilot grants from the college for, um, for people who want to get started on, on that scanner. We are supporting, or the scanner allows for obviously anatomical imaging, whole body imaging. We have coils that really cover from the head to the, over the spine to a knee coil, all of these different types of coils. Um, we have multinuclear capability. That means we can do sodium imaging, we can do phosphorus imaging. We have all the fMRI equipment, uh, diffusion tensor imaging, diffusion weighted imaging, and so on. We do a lot of development in flow measurements. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about a few projects there. Uh, and a lot of development in MR spectroscopy. I would say that, especially on the scanner, our expertise, we have a few MR spectroscopy experts that are developing novel sequences in that uh, regard that are being developed for both for Siemens and GE platforms. But um, so a lot of what you hear here might also be, you will um, see that this might also be available on the GE scanner. And then uh, one of the highlights that we have going on and I'll be showing a few case, uh, a few images of that is development of novel um, iron imaging, uh, myelin imaging and, and manganese imaging methods, uh, partially with the development of ultra short TE sequences and some other advanced sequences that um, so some of our users are developing. I have a slide here, again, just about some technical deta details. It is a 60 centimeter bore um, scanner. It is a Siemens Prisma magneton. It has very strong gradients, 80 milli Tesla um, gradient system. That means it can go very fast and with high resolution up to 64 independent RF channels. So it allows to run a 64 channel head coil. Uh, we also have a standard channel, 20 channel head coil, but um, and very nicely, we have the, the spine coil on the bed. Um, we have a 15 channel knee coil if you do extremities, um, as well as several flexible surface coils and, and other types of um, array coils that you can just put around anywhere, anywhere in the body or if you have like in our pigs, for example, if you want to just cover them with a flexible surface coil. Um, we also have two multinuclear coils. One is a um, dual tuned proton and sodium knee coil, and the other one a dual tuned um, proton and phosphorus abdominal coil. Um, for fMRI, we have visual projection system, an auditory stimulation system, fiber optic response buttons, joystick response system, fiber optic microphone for speech recording. So th that's basically just the standard equipment that we, we do offer here. And um, we have on the scanner also access to any advanced sequences through the pulse programming environment and through research contract with Siemens where we can get work in progress packages from other users or from Siemens itself that are not yet clinically available. And with that, I'm jumping into just giving you a couple of different um, project examples. And I would like, I'm just trying to see if I should open up the chat box so that if there are questions that I will actually see them. <laughs> okay, got it there. Just, this is tricky, <laughs> sorry. Okay, so now if people want to interrupt or put in a question, now I can actually see it. Um, here are some examples from our nutrition department um, on fMRI, uh, subject, uh, fMRI studies, where you can also see the setup of our um, MRI scanner. We have an, a separate um, computer there that allows to provide the stimulation images. For example, this was a study on appetite and on breakfast eating in, in adult, adolescence, I think. 
And um, so you can see the muffins here that were projected for the subject inside the scanner to see, and they would have to, to give certain responses. And actually in this study here, these people, they then got out of the scanner and within the MRI facility had their blood drawn three times a day. They would stay at the facility and get uh, further MRI scans three times a day to see how that changed throughout the day. And this is another example just from a regular appetite and neural reward system fMRI um, study that was, that was done in the past. One very novel thing that we have, and this is not just on the Siemens scanner, this is also for the GE scanner, is that we have now an MRI compatible EEG um, system. As you can see here, this um, EEG um, electroencephalography coil that can be put on the head uh, with 32 channels as well. Um, and that is MR compatible that you can put the person into the scanner and then simultaneously record the EEG with the fMRI. And in this study, it was also developed to measure the flow of the cerebral spiral, uh, uh, spinal fluid. So the CSF flow, which is some novel development in um, by our users, um, ma mainly Yunji Tong. And um, you can see that you can now simultaneously, so this, this is an axis in time in seconds, um, simultaneously record all three of these systems without too much crosstalk or anything else. So, and this is being used in a study on sleep. So these subjects are actually coming in in the evening. They're put to sleep in the scanners. And once they're really asleep, then um, the scans will start, um, will get started on them. And it's a study on uh, sleep, breathing, hemodynamic oscillations, and cerebral spinal fluid movements, building towards a novel treatment approach for Alzheimer's disease. So I just wanted to mention that actually this system is available by Dr. Um, Tong, who is pictured here himself. Um, to, to collaborate with him, he will be happy to help um, anybody use it or if, if there's interest that um, to do these kind of measurements simultaneously. And they, this is feasible both on our Siemens and on our GE scanner. Um, some other images here, um, examples from our multinuclear imaging from sodium. We developed some sodium imaging. This is this, this dual tuned knee coil where we have actually built a holder underneath to put in calibration sources with different uh, amounts of sodium in it that get, that, that get scanned simultaneously. You can see those are these little uh, dots underneath the calf muscle here. And so these will allow us to calibrate the signal so that you get absolute concentrations from the MRI signal to your sodium concentrations. Um, this has worked really nice for some quantification of sodium in different types of muscles and has been published and is also available for, for studies, has been used in some nutrition studies um, and right now is being actually used in, at UCLA for another uh, sodium study that liked this idea and took it over. Um, simultaneously, you can also, with the same coil, without changing the person actually out of the coil, um, you can measure sodium, uh, sorry, lipids. So with, pro with the proton channel, you can not only do water and fat images, but actually with spectroscopy, with proton spectroscopy, you can identify all the different lipid um, peaks and quantify the different types of lipid peaks within the different areas of the muscle. And I do see a first question here um, about whether raw data from the scanners is available in some, some anonymous form. Um, yes, so the data on, on the scanner, first of all, you're not allowed to put in any names uh, at our facility. So all of them need, need to be coded and they will then be transferred to a server that only you will have access to your, your directory and you can then get all the way down to the very raw data of the scanner, the Twix data on the Siemens scanner, the P files on the GE scanners. Um, and um, we do not currently have a repository that goes across the different projects. I think all the users themselves, the PIs of the projects themselves might have some repositories. Um, here's another example uh, going to the abdomen, um, two studies that were looking at stomach motility 
an fMRI to study the gut brain axis. So just to give you an idea um, what type of studies are all possible, they were studying both fMRI and gut, um, gut mobility at this point. And in this study here, they were looking at different types of milk and milk intolerance and looking at the timeline of how fast it is that, that it takes to, um, to start digesting the milk or for the milk to actually pass through the, the gastric system. So um, this was also a user that came and said they're interested in doing this and the MRI facility staff helped in developing and putting up all these um, methods so that it became feasible and be it became a funded study. Some other um, novelties were that is very new, that's by Dr. Emir. He um, you, um, recently developed a, a fast ultra short TE uh, rosette MRI technique. So with the rosette trajectory to be that fast um, for iron imaging and depending on um, whether or not he measures actually also the T2 with it, he can measure myelin um, within the brain and is, is currently doing myelin imaging in some um, studies also on, I think on autism and, and Alzheimer's. And uh, here you can see some, some very nice iron maps showing the um, globus pallidus and the basal ganglia shining up with the very high, um, high iron. And these are some other techniques that we currently use in some quantitative um, MRI methods that where we are also looking into iron imaging as well as manganese imaging. Um, and so, oops, here's another example of, of metal imaging. This is a, a project of my own where we're looking at manganese deposition in the brain um, but from welders who are exposed to welding fumes. And you can see here that this can be quite visible to, with the T1, um, the T1 contrast. And if we then do some special post-processing and we do not just an mp rage image, but real quantitative imaging of the T1 relaxation time, we can then process it. And we, what you see in yellow here is the, um, is the manganese that is, is higher than the normal brain manganese content or where the, the group of welders had higher manganese than the group of controls. And it, it shows nicely here that it was kind of following those white matter tracks. And we know that manganese is diffusing along white matter into the other um, gray matter areas where it then causes toxicity that is then again measured with MRS and um, spectroscopy. Um, I have another question, I guess, to the slide before about whether it is possible to get MRS of bone lipids. Um, not at this moment. I think um, it, it's decaying too fast. However, I'm pretty sure that um, talking to Dr. Emir, he really likes these kind of challenges where to develop methods where you have to be looking at a very fast decay. So I don't want to say that it's completely impossible, but I think at a, as of this moment, we cannot really measure it, um, it off the bone lipid. In general, we do a lot of spectroscopy and a lot of different um, Body parts, brain, obviously, looking at um, an acetyl aspartate, glucose, glutamate, GABA, glutathione, lactate, and so on. But also another project that we have ongoing that together with IU School of Medicine. So we're developing the methods at Purdue, and then it will be translated over to the scanners at IU, is on phosphorus um, liver scanning um, here where you see very different peaks that um, allow you to scan ATP and the gloss, um, glycerophosphor, um, oh, what is this? GPE and GPC, uh, um, sorry. Um, I'm gonna leave it out, I'm blanking on it now. And inorganic phosphate and phosphocreatine, but anyhow, all of these um, peaks are very sensitive to changes and in, for example, tumor and tumor environment and tumor response to treatment. And so these are of high interest and their ratios are of high interest in response to, um, for example, radiotherapy. And currently we're also trying to look at um, analyzing whether we can identify a, um, a signal ratio that would tell us something about the risk in a fatty liver disease to develop cancer or not. And um, 
Another speciality is the measurement of GABA and glutathione um, with editing methods. So in the regular clinical MRS methods, you usually cannot identify GABA because it sits underneath this high um, creatine peak here at 3 ppm, and you cannot quantify it as such. So there are special editing um, possibilities that will allow you to do to, to actually get down to the GABA peak. So you're dividing out the, the creatine peak basically. And also another method to look at the glutathione peak, which is an antioxidant and quite of interest in all these um, oxidative stress situations. And so we are using these methods in quite a few studies also on neurodegeneration um, to um, post-traumatic stress disorder and uh, several other neurodegenerative um, disorders to study that. And one of the specialities of Dr. Amir and myself is to try to develop high resolution, fast mapping methods of these metabolites, in particular of GABA, um, maybe also glutathione. Right now we have only GABA working nicely. And with that, um, we, we are able to actually map out uh, large parts of the brain. And finally, I just wanted to show that we do not only do human scanning, we do have some canine um, patients that are coming in and that we are doing um, studies on, on brain tumor with the vet school. And the same thing is here with pig, these are pig models, mini pig models that, that it was a study on um, radiation. Um, radiation injury after radiation treatment. Um, because that we know in children, they often develop white matter problems that then last a lifelong. And so this was a study trying to identify what kind of um, how these these uh, white matter changes are caused by what type of radiation um, levels and so on. Um, and this was done in a pig model. Okay, and I'm going to answer that one question still, how reliable is GSH? quantification from edited MRS? Um, I would say if you had access to a 70 human scanner and you don't have to do edited MRS, it might, might be a little bit more robust in giving you signal. Um, the editing, as you could see in, yeah, in, in here, um, you need to have a brain region. You need to have a pretty large volume, usually three by three by three centimeters at least in order to get a clean signal. You also, it is uh, more tricky in some brain regions than in others. However, I can say that we do have studies that have really optimized their setup and their protocol and are getting pretty reliable results um, from that. Now, how much the the, it's not an absolute quantification. So these, the values you get, they will be um, very reliable com compared to a control group that you measure. But I, I would not um, say that they're in any way absolute um, quantifiable. I, I hope that answers your question. And with that, I'm passing over to Dr. Rispoli. I'm Joseph Rispoli. I'm the faculty director of the engineering MRI facility, uh, which comprises a GE Healthcare 3 Tesla human scanner uh, with many similarities to what Dr. Didek just spoke about with uh, the Siemens scanner. It is side by side again in the same building, uh, which is very convenient, uh, particularly uh, for studies that might utilize both scanners. The GE Healthcare Discovery MR750 has uh, many similar specifications to the Siemens Prisma. The gradient system uh, is not quite as high of an amplitude, uh, but we still uh, can achieve uh, you know, very high resolution images. Uh, it has the same uh, slew rate of 200 tesla per meter per second. We have our primary coil for brain imaging on the GE scanner is a 32 channel uh, array from Nova Medical, uh, which is a, a very common uh, coil that's used across platforms uh, uh, in many different sites internationally. Uh, we have multiple RF coils and arrays from GE that came with the scanner. Uh, the brain imaging is, is best with the Nova, uh, but there are lower channel count or even quadrature head coils. Uh, we have a, a couple different sized, uh, flexible, somewhat blanket array coils that can be wrapped around different 
uh, anatomies, depending on what you would want to image. We have uh, one highlight of the engineering facility is we have custom gateways, uh, which uh, allow us to connect very easily uh, homebrew or in-house radio frequency coils. Uh, so for up to 16 channels uh, of receive or a quadrature uh, transmit receive coil, uh, which is standard uh, RF connectors, uh, BNC connectors, uh, without the need to create a custom coil that has the complete proprietary GE uh, uh, connector uh, that commercial coils would have. Uh, we also have a, the Respirac gas delivery system for CO2 challenges. And we have, uh, thanks to Professor Yunji Tong, uh, who uh, Dr. Didek mentioned uh, using the EEG cap, uh, he also uh, purchased uh, MRI compatible near infrared spectroscopy system uh, for facility use, uh, which has 16 laser sources and 32 detectors uh, for NEARS uh, imaging. Uh, and finally, we have an audiovisual stimulation system for the GE as well. Uh, ours is uh, the Nordic NeuroLab product uh, with headphones, uh, LCD goggles, a trigger box, and uh, fiber optic button pads. Uh, for the subject to respond. Uh, the Purdue M Engineering MRI facility, as the name implies, is primarily supported by the College of Engineering. Uh, it supports many of the same applications and sequence types uh, that the uh, Siemens does, uh, with the notable exception at present, uh, the GE scanner cannot do multi-nuclear uh, spectroscopy. Uh, or imaging. The system is capable of it, but we don't own any coils uh, at present that can do that on the GE. Um, so we can do anatomical imaging, whole body, uh, fMRI, the diffusion imaging, flow measurements, uh, proton spectroscopy, and uh, advanced sequences like ultra short echo time, UTE. Uh, we also have a research agreement with GE Healthcare where we can gain access to any number of their WIP sequences, their work in progress sequences, which are uh, essentially beta testing uh, new cutting edge sequences uh, along with GE. And uh, of course, uh, this scanner does support custom RF coils and I'll give uh, an example later. Uh, talking about projects uh, that have used the engineering MRI facility, uh, several of them, uh, were in conjunction with the Purdue Neurotrauma Group, or PNG, uh, which is a, a large collaborative team uh, that, that includes myself, uh, Professor Tong, and Professor Didek as well, as you'll see on a, a couple of subsequent slides. Uh, so uh, most of the previous activities uh, were with PNG studies were uh, doing longitudinal scans of high school collision sport athletes uh, as well as non-collision sport controls. And uh, we have acquired, I believe, eight seasons of data uh, going through from before practices began to the end of the season. Uh, and uh, the sequences that we would run on these types of uh, sessions included uh, fMRI, structural diffusion, spectroscopy. Um, so it was, it was a quite a uh, a sequence of a multi-parametric uh, data acquisition. Uh, here is some of the earliest results that the PNG uh, uh, released uh, that uh, primarily were from Professor Tom Talavich and Eric Nauman uh, using fMRI to show that uh, symptoms are really a subset of injury and that uh, collision sport athletes who have an accumulation of subconcussive hits uh, throughout the season had very similar fMRI signatures compared to, uh, for example, one, uh, one of the participants uh, had a major concussion in a car crash and was imaged the next day. Uh, so uh, through this, uh, they uh, started uh, you know, releasing uh, studies with other imaging modalities as well. Uh, the, the next one uh, utilized resting state functional connectivity changes uh, based on subconcussive load. So this is uh, a different uh, type of functional MRI. Uh, it's not task-based uh, where you're responding to stimuli. Instead, uh, you're going into the, the bore of the scanner and being asked to not think about anything and just see what the uh, default mode network 
uh, of your brain, uh, what sort of functional connectivity exists between different uh, regions within the brain. And uh, Dr. Joaquin Gonyi has led a lot of this research. Um, and here are some initial results uh, showing connectivity differences between uh, controls and some collision sport athletes. As far as diffusion uh, weighted imaging analysis uh, as part of this overall PNG study, uh, this, uh, this graphic illustrates uh, areas uh, in the brain where white matter changes were widespread uh, between uh, the two different study groups. And finally, uh, spectroscopy um, as part of this study was uh, two uh, volumes, two single voxel acquisitions uh, of proton spectroscopy and uh, it was found there are many uh, differences in, in uh, concentrations of different metabolites uh, based on football athletes versus the controls. Uh, Professor uh, Yunji Tong, um, is, so I mentioned in addition to the EEG cap, uh, he also has this functional, uh, I'm sorry, this NEARS uh, setup, the near infrared spectroscopy. And he uh, is undergoing studies comparing uh, the near signal to the whole brain uh, fMRI signal and correlations between the two. So uh, through uh, Professor Tong's work um, with Tulavage, uh, Professor Nauman and myself, um, they've uh, published some work on characterizing the near signal under hypercapnia and comparisons to functional MRI. And then finally, I mentioned uh, that we can connect custom RF coils to the scanner. Uh, so a project out of my group, uh, we developed uh, several actually different stretchable RF coils. Uh, this is one example, a 20 channel stretchable RF coil array as shown at left. It was uh, uh, four rows of five uh, loop elements on a omnidirectionally stretchable fabric um, that we later uh, incorporated into wearable coils uh, into clothing, so to speak. And we underwent a, uh, a variety of, of anatomical scans to compare the stretchable array with the commercial GE coil. Um, and uh, the, the results were beautiful with the stretchable array. Um, the, on the left on this uh, section, you see the stretchable coil images at right, the commercial. Uh, they both you know, look adequate, but when we actually did an SNR comparison, a signal to noise comparison, uh, we always achieved uh, significantly higher signal to noise with the stretchable array, which uh, would allow you to speed up your scans uh, through acceleration uh, or potentially uh, acquire the higher resolution. In addition uh, to those anatomies that were mostly uh, different joints in the body, we prototyped uh, this for supine breast MRI as well as uh, C-spine imaging. Uh, and both of those uh, were promising as well. Uh, another uh, hardware uh, associated project um, from John Ninehouse, a professor emeritus of electrical engineering uh, is investigating uh, the induced heating during MRI on wires within medical implants. Uh, so here, uh, his project was looking at the pacemaker wires, lead wires, and investigating whether metallic shielding uh, can reduce the induced heating. And at right, you see a photo of a large uh, industry standard phantom uh, for evaluating heating during a scan. And uh, this sort of phantom uh, and a variety of phantoms, uh, we don't have a slide on that, but we have spectroscopy phantoms and just imaging phantoms. Uh, that are very useful when you're doing your protocol development uh, before you do human subjects. Uh, and then finally, something very different, uh, Ronnie Wilbur from Speech Language Hearing Sciences uh, with Jeff Siskin in Electrical Engineering, uh, done work using FMRI, fMRI and machine learning uh, to investigate neurolinguistics uh, with uh, different uh, types of uh, classifications of, of uh, uh, different words and uh, feeding this into their uh, machine lear learning algorithms, uh, which uh, this is a fascinating but uh, completely different topic. 
And so with that, I see Professor Diva Chan is, is on. And I will uh, try to uh, pass the control to her. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for thanks for joining again. Um, and you know, since I just managed to join a few minutes ago, thanks to class, um, I can do a quick introduction while we get things transferred over from slideshow to slideshow. Um, so I'm Dr. Diva Chan. I'm an assistant professor in biomedical engineering um, in the College of Engineering here at Purdue. Um, and I'm the current director of the small animal MRI facility. All right, so I'm here to introduce the small animal MRI facility. Um, it's located in the Binley Bioscience Center at Discovery Park. Um, and the preclinical 7T system is actually just located in the basement. And so conveniently enough for those doing uh, small animal work, uh, it's actually next to a small animal facility. And so as we probably did mention before, these are very much compatible with animal studies. Um, and if you need guidance in how to write up your IACUC so that you are allowed to bring your animals over to the preclinical 7T, um, I or the or Dr. Greg Tamer will be able to provide uh, some guidance on that as well. And so the system we have uh, in that basement is the Bruker Biospec 70 uh, MRI. Um, and it's a facility operated by myself and primarily managed on a day-to-day -day basis by Dr. Greg Tamer. Um, and as we've mentioned before, it's also eligible for CTSI core pilot grants uh, because it falls under Indiana CTSI as a core facility. And that's a status that we renew every single year. And one of the things that I will mention, I don't necessarily have a slide for this, is that a lot of the techniques that have been mentioned previously for the 3T systems, the, both the Siemens and the GE, are systems are, are techniques that rely on MRI physics. And so they can actually be scaled up or scaled down uh, when it comes to being able to use it on small animal work on the 7T system. And so our system is compatible not only with small animals like mice and rats, um, but also other, you know, other small animals, potentially birds, as well as tissues and larger tissue specimens that you may want to examine um, post-mortem as well. So what we have to accommodate all those is a variety of volume and surface coils. And these are ones that are supported by Bruker and part of our service arrangement. Um, and the various volume body coils, you can see here that they are these cylindrical, um, there are cylindrical coils that enable you to fit a mouse or a rat or a tissue or some other specimen inside. And we have them in a variety of diameters that suits the need for uh, different sized animals as well as different sized specimens. We also have a mouse head volume coil for those that are interested in doing um, more brain imaging in the mouse, um, as well as surface coils that can sit on top of the mouse and rat head for similar types of imaging. And then finally, we have some other surface ring coils of various diameters that enable you to get closer to your anatomy of interest, uh, depending on the size of the animal, as well as the types of imaging that you're trying to achieve. In addition to that, we have access to anesthesia and some physiologic monitoring systems that pair well with our MRI system. Um, this enables us to do triggered and gated imaging. And so you can sync up physiologic uh, signals such as ECG and breathing with your imaging system. Um, and this is available for both mouse and rat scans as well as adaptable for any other small animals. In addition to that, we have uh, right next to the MRI suite, a surgical suite um, and an area for you to be able to prepare your specimens, your animals or your other tissues um, in, in that space. If you have specific questions about the space availability or what type of sample or subject might be compatible with imaging as well as being able to prepare it in this space, um, please definitely reach out to myself or Dr. Tamer with those questions. And finally, I know we've mentioned uh, the education and training before um, for any potential users of the 7T. They're going to have to go through uh, various safety seminars to be able to have access to Binley, as well as access to the room that the MR uh, suite is in. This includes hands-on training uh, for independent system operation. 
Uh, we typically re recommend that students, especially graduate students, um, take BME 515. Um, and this is a spring course um, that instructors in BME teach, and it includes a lab component that enables students to be able to train towards independent system operation. Um, they, they are trained to be able to independently operate, uh, but they don't have to go through the separate um, independent operator evaluation that's at the end of the course uh, for whichever scanner they want access to. Um, that is something that they can arrange separately with Dr. Tamer in order to get access and the creation of a, an account on our computer system. Um, and I just want to plug all the other MRI courses that also exist on campus in order to teach folks about not just how to operate the system, but also the physics um, and the applications that are relevant. Uh, so again, manager of operations is Dr. Greg Tamer, um, and sometimes we are assisted by Dr. Nathan Ooms as well, who's the MR technologist. Um, and you know, I, in the interest of time to enable anybody to ask any other questions, I'll just go through one of the applications that can be done uh, on our 7T system. Um, and one of these is cardiovascular CINE MRI. And so essentially we're able to take uh, high frame rate images of the heart um, in the mouse. Uh, and, you know, so as you may or may not know, the mouse has a heart rate of about 500 uh, beats per minute. And so we're able to get very high, very, very high frame rates in order to image the heart morphology um, from end diastole to peak systole all the way to end diastole again. And this is some of the work that's done in the cardiovascular imaging research lab that's run by Dr. Craig Gorgian. Um, and this enables us to be able to track the deformation of these cardiac tissues during that time. We can do both in this case, bright blood, uh, where you actually are able to visualize uh, the blood flow into and out of the heart versus black blood, which actually uh, oversaturates the blood signal so that you can focus on the tissue and uh, the tissue morphology of the heart. Um, and so there are different sequences that are available, uh, again, on the Bruker system uh, that are very similar to the clinical systems that we've been talking about for the, almost the last hour now. Um, and I think that's that's pretty much it for me. I didn't want to overwhelm everybody with applications because on the Bruker system, anything that we've really talked about in the last 40 something minutes on the 3T systems um, can be transferable to the 7T. The sequences are available either by from directly from Bruker um, or from other scientists around the world that are working on this type of imaging. And so we're able to help facilitate get, getting those sequences to Purdue um, if you have that need come up. And again, that's something that I and Dr. Greg Tamer are happy to talk to new and current users about. And with that, I'll lend this back to uh, um, Dr. Dida. Eva, could you please just continue um, with the remaining slides that are- Okay, just... yeah. That's easier than switching back. Um, yes, because that's just um, all of the um, all of the staff that's available. So the, um, Dr. Chen just mentioned a lot of times, um, Dr. Tamer, who is the um, operations manager for the small animal um, facility, as well as for the engineering facility. And then we have Dr. Zhou, who is the um, operations manager and the MR physicist for the um, Siemens scanner or the life science facility. And then we have an MR technologist, Dr. Um, Nathan Ohms, who is actually a MR technologist for all three systems <laughs> and is more than happy and willing to help with scanning on any of the three systems. So, and then, yes, with that, thank you everybody again, and please ask your questions. There's a question in the chat. Okay. It's about flow imaging. I guess that is, are, you, are there ongoing studies on compressed sensing and fast MRI imaging for 4D flow? Um, I know there is, there is a study on 4D flow um, by Dr. Rice, Dr. Rice, right? Um, please, Dr. Rice Bolly, correct me if I'm saying something wrong. I'm not 100% sure if he's using compressed sensing or not, honestly. Um, I know he's, uh, doing some, trying to do some cardiac 
and some other type of, of flow imaging. And then, also, of course, there's also all the um, development for getting the flow of the CSF, which is very tricky by itself. But I think that's not using the 4D flow. The 4D flow is, is um, Dr. Rice. Um, I would have, I have to blank on whether or not he's using compressed sensing. I'm sorry about that. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure either. And, and he's primarily been using the semen scanner um, for those studies. So yeah, we have the 4D flow whip um, on that scanner that's also used at Northwestern. Any other questions? Again, if anybody is interested, please feel free to contact us later on. I had a question. Sorry. Um, for this small animal um, MRI, would you be able to put, say, a rabbit leg in there? Does the rabbit leg have to be attached to the rabbit? Still? That was my next question. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe? I don't know. Yes or no? Um, so definitely you would be able to put a rabbit leg in there. Um, I think it could be a little bit more difficult if you wanted it still attached to the rest of the rabbit. Um, although the, the volume coil is actually really just overlapping with the anatomy that you want to image, right? And so depending on how we set it up, you could probably have an anesthetized rabbit um, and then just have the leg going through the volume coil that does the imaging and then the rabbit can sort of stick out of the rest of it. But you would potentially have to either, does we would probably guide you through either designing a specific gantry in order to hold the rabbit securely mm -hmm. if they're anesthetized um, or we'll help with the padding so that you know you, the, the rabbit isn't strained in any way or moving during the scans. Um, but, but just, you know, I've done rabbit leg scans on their own but without the rest of the rabbit. Um, so, so I think we, you know, if it's something you're interested in, um, I think we can definitely work with probably a rabbit carcass and see if we can actually position it physically into that space with the volume coil that you need. Um, and I think that would help us answer that question fairly quickly. Thank you very much. Of course. And I will add that, you know, we, we get requests a lot for different types of animals, uh, from, from birds to cats um, to, to just tissues. Um, so it's always best to just reach out and see if anyone, any investigators have done that before on our sm small animal scanner. Um, and even if not, again, we're, we're more than willing to, to work with you to, to make something work for the system you're interested in. Well, I don't see any more questions. Uh, if you do have questions, feel free to reach out to the core. I'm sure they'll be happy to answer them for you. But I'd like to thank them again for presenting and thank you everyone for uh, joining the seminar.